Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. The handout reference during this presentation is available for download on the audio section of our website. Our speaker this evening attained his Master's of Divinity and Master's of Arts degree in Moral Theology from Mount St. Mary Seminary in 1989 ordained to the priesthood in that same year. Monsignor Pope has served at several parishes in the Archdiocese of Washington and was named a Monsignor in 2005 by Pope Benedict XVI. He has served as pastor at Holy Comforter St. Cyprian Parish in Washington, D.C. since 2007. He also blogs regularly for the Archdiocese of Washington. Please join me in welcoming back Monsignor Charles Pope. We're here today to reflect on something which the sacrament of, of confession is something that we're always encouraged to go to and um, uh, we're required to go to if we have any mortal sin, but um, we are not always required if we have just what we call venial sins, but even, you know, I don't know about you, but sometimes the distinction between mortal and venial gets a little academic because, you know, maybe like one sock on the floor is a small crime, but 12 or 15 socks on the floor... The room's kind of trash. You know, even venial sins can pile up after a while. You praying with me? So get, get, get to confession regularly. But here comes the problem, and that's what I was kind of asked to address tonight. If we were to integrate confession into the life of prayer, a lot of people struggle with a, with a number of um, aspects of confession. The, the, the problem is that very often our, our celebration of the sacrament becomes kind of routine. It becomes... Uh, you know, well, let, let me just give you an example. You have this beautiful picture here on the flyer, and I don't know, maybe this, this woman looks French and the priest looks French, so I don't know. Miss Beauvoir has gone to confession. Uh, but for there, I have, I have yelled at my children. I have yelled at my, uh, my spouse. I am not always praying as good as I should. Uh, please forgive me. And, uh, he, and the father says, please say three Hail Marys. <laughs> And, um, and she goes away, but she kind of realizes, now I, I don't mean to read into this too much, but she kind of realizes she should probably be back next month with the same stuff. And, you know, she doesn't expect much, and frankly, the priest doesn't expect much. See you again next month. Now, again, nothing against the sacrament, but our expectations are not always very high when it comes to the sacrament of confession. And therefore, I want to propose a revolutionary idea with confession that has been somewhat lost. It all comes down to simply one little word, one word with a question mark at the end. And, and it's simply this, why? Why are you getting angry with your husband? Why are you going on the internet looking at stuff you shouldn't look at? Why are you drinking too much? Why? You know, why? It's a simple but a revolutionary question. And it, it's an invitation to go deeper. See, one of the dangers, and here comes the problem, I gave you the example of poor Miss Beauvoir, but um, we tend to confess external behaviors. We tend to confess external behaviors. And, and we should, by the way, don't get me wrong. But the question is, do we ever explore maybe some of the deeper roots of why we are doing what we are doing, all right? So with that in mind, I want to give you a couple of scriptures and then we'll look at some of the deeper roots that we should begin to maybe begin to have more of a vocabulary about. Um, I'm going to give you three scripture quotes and they pose the revolutionary question. This is from the book of James. James asks you a question. He's asking you now. He's not talking to someone 2,000 years ago. He's asking you. Are you ready? Where... Do the wars and the conflicts among you come from? Is it not from your passions that make war within you? Hmm? Now, don't, don't get too lost in the word war. 
I mean, we're not just talking, you know, missiles going away. But the wars, first of all, in our family, among people we should love and respect, you know, where does all that tension, where does all that anger, where does, you know, I mean, some of the meanest people in the world to each other are married people. I mean, they will treat us, you know, people, strangers, they'll be polite, but to each other, you know, where does that stuff come from, see? Where's all that venom? What's, what's the root of it? See? So don't just think wars between nations, you know. But James is asking you a question. Where do the wars among you come from? Is it not wars and conflicts? Where do they come from? Is it not from your passions that make war within you? If you're writing it down, James 4 and verse 1. All right? So, again, he asks a question, and he supplies you an answer, but without all the details. Namely, is it not from those passions that wage war? So, again, he's asking you and me to look a little deeper. And we're going to try to do some of that tonight, see? Some of you who are with me in the moral theology course, we did a little bit of this work together, right? But I can almost guarantee you, if you've got anger going on, there's fear underneath of it. I almost guarantee it. You know, there is such a thing as righteous anger, right? But... Most of the unrighteous anger is rooted in some kind of fear. All right? And we'll, we'll look a little bit at that tonight. Now, another example here. This is from Jesus. I'm quoting now from Matthew 23 and in the 26th verse. Matthew 23, 26. Jesus says, blind Pharisee. He's not talking to me, of course. <laughs> blind Pharisee. Cleanse first the inside of the cup so that also the outside might be clean. So again, that, that question why is hiding there, isn't it? Why is the outside of the cup all deranged and messed up and doing bad stuff? Because of the inside of the cup. See? Something on the inside finally works its way to the outside. See? All right? So we, we want to not just say, well, I yelled at my wife or I yelled at my kids or I took a few things at work or I hate my boss, I hate my job, I hate my... I drink too much to get rid of the hate. <laughs> you know, I mean, but, you know, you get the idea. So there, there, there is this problem that we, we have to look a little deeper. Why? Where's all that stuff coming from? See? Now, one more quote. Um, again, Jesus is talking. Mark, chapter 7, and verse 21. Jesus says, From within, from within, out of the heart of a person come evil thoughts, Fornication, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these things come from within. He was responding to people who were all upset that, well, what about kosher law? What about the right foods and, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. And Jesus says, you know, you're all concerned about what goes into your mouth. You don't seem to care much about what comes out of your mouth. Again, but listen to what he's saying again. Listen, from within, from out of the heart of a person come evil thoughts theft, fornication, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these things come from within. So he's asking you and me to, again, look inside and ask the revolutionary question that will bring confession and root it deeply in your own spiritual life, in your own moral reflection, and it will make confession more fruitful, this revolutionary question, why am I doing what I'm doing? That requires you and me to examine our hearts, to say, what are the deeper drives? And sometimes they're so deep and sometimes so subtle that we don't even know they're going on. Now, if I were to ask you, and I'll call it to your attention, but if we were to really silence the room and listen, we'd hear these lights buzzing. All these uh, fluorescent lights, they make a buzzing sound. You just, screen, you just screen it out. Anyone remember, well, sadly, but anyone remember 9-11 and all the planes were called out of the sky? I went outside and I heard the most eerie silence I've ever heard in my life. I did not hear any jet noise in the background. You don't even think about that, but it's up there all day long. Now, my point to you is that there are things that sometimes are so deep and so subtle, and they're going on all the time so that we hardly even notice them anymore. But they are going on, and they are moving us to sinful and unrighteous behaviors. See? And that's where we want to spend a little time tonight, looking at some of these drives, some of these sources. So again, the revolutionary question that breaks open confession and makes it more fruitful for you is not for you to just go and confess what you did 
external behaviors, in other words, but to ask that revolutionary question, why am I doing that? See? Now, if I have time with a penitent, I might spend some time and ask them some of those questions, you know, and we start to, we don't just preach, turn away from vice, but we try to also preach virtue, virtue. Um, so we'll look a little bit tonight. I don't have time to develop. Right now, we're going to kind of sadly kind of focus on more of the negative drives. But there are positive virtues that are meant to bring these things alive for you and for me. So we'll look at those things also as we go through this list tonight. So well, what are some of these deeper drives? Now, one good place to begin is the seven deadly sins. But I think there are other places to look, and I'm going to add a few a few thoughts to those seven deadly sins tonight. But if you got your sheet, take that list that says the seven deadly sins. And um, we're going to look at some of these drives. And St. Thomas has a, you know, it, sometimes people find it difficult to read Thomas. Uh, so I'm kind of synthesizing some of his thoughts. But I'm also, uh, if you want a, a very good book, if you don't have it on your shelf, I'll bet most of you do because you're above average. <laughs> but um, it's Peter Kreef's book, Back to Virtue, Back to to Virtue by Peter Kreeft. He is a, it's a wonderful book that sets forth these seven deadly sins. Um, there's another good book on Ave Maria Press by a guy named Thompson, simply entitled The Seven Deadly Sins. Very original. You know, he stole the title. <laughs> like I stole the title, The Ten Commandments, for my book, right? Okay. But anyway, all those are just ways of saying that um, uh, good sources, you, you should study these things. What we do tonight is hopefully just the beginning. I know a lot of you are already familiar with the seven deadly sins, but if I were to ask the average Catholic, what are the seven deadly sins, they might come up with a couple, but they couldn't probably come up with all seven, and you ought to be able to. And the reason for that is, when you can name something, you start to have authority over it. Oh, I see you. There you go again, sloth. Or I see you. I see you, envy. I know your moves. Now, Thomas, uh, we won't go through all the layers and levels that we could possibly go through tonight because we, we don't have time. But Thomas not only distinguishes the seven deadly sins, but also their ugly daughters, and <laughs> the daughters, if you will, of, of the seven deadly sins and some of the, the things that plug into and relate to them. So if you ever take time, if, you, if you're able to read the Summa directly, but if not, I would recommend Peter Kreef's book. It's a pretty good to mystic treatment of the seven deadly sins. That's a good place to begin. And not only does he look at the seven deadly sins, but he also then looks at the Beatitudes and other virtues that are meant to combat. And we won't have time to do all of that tonight, so I refer you to that. Now, with that in mind, let's look at them. Pride, all right, greed, lust, anger, gluttony, envy, and sloth. These are the seven deadly sins. Now, in the ancient uh, church, they, they, these were actually called the seven thoughts. The, a lot of the Greek fathers refer to them as the seven thoughts because... They're not so much sins, per se, they're attitudes. And attitudes are very deeply rooted in our intellect. Now, you, you've heard me say this before, especially if you've been in courses with me. Sow a thought, reap a deed. Sow a deed, reap a habit. Sow a habit, reap a character. Sow a character, reap a destiny. Okay, and it all begins in the old noodle. So much of our struggle, the real battleground, is your mind. It's your mind. Because, you know, again, sow a thought, reap a deed. Now, by the way, there's something skipped in that list, but I would also say sow a thought, reap a feeling. Most of our feelings, I'd say 95% of them, come from our thoughts. We think, well, our feelings just happen. No, they don't. They actually come from our thoughts. Let me give you a quick example. Uh, I was uh, some years ago walking with a brother priest, uh, several brother priests, but just to focus on two of us, um, and we were walking in a neighborhood somewhere up in Maryland, and... Um, this big golden Labrador came woof, 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 coming across, came coming out of the front door of a house. Now, I grew up with dogs. My aunt and uncle remind you, we had Prince, the big Dalmatian, and little Molly, and, and, and we, had, uh, we had Missy, and all these. I grew up with dogs. And I know a vicious parade of a dog, you know, rushing at you with, you know, wanting to bite you, from a, just, just a dog saying, hey, 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 I want you to know something. I work here. Who do you think you are, huh? You know. <laughs> Uh, let me smell your hand and make sure, you know. But, but my, my other priest friend had been bitten very savagely by a dog as a youngster and almost died from the dog bite. So you've got two men looking at the same information, okay? One man's in a panic and angry. Get that dog! He was yelling at the neighbor, get, the, get, get your dog, you know. And, and I'm like, come here, Rover. 
Okay, now what's the difference? It's our thoughts, which then produce feelings. See, I, I'm, I'm referring to my own experiences, which is maybe a little bit deeper than thought, but I'm thinking, I'm looking at the same information, thinking, knowing, and understanding, and he's looking at the same information with a different set of thoughts. One is in a panic and very angry. Fear almost always leads to anger. And then another guy's like, come here, Rover, come here. And I, gra- I gently grabbed the dog, let him smell my hand, and took him back to its owner. And my priest friend was still angry. Why did you let that dog out of the house? I said, <laughs> you know, it sometimes happens. Okay? Now, thoughts are important. And that's why I want to emphasize that these aren't just, we call them the seven deadly sins. But really, they're attitudes. And even before they're attitudes, they're thoughts. Okay? And they're very deep drives. And we need to learn a little bit about how to define them, how to name them, and how to distinguish them. And then we need to be able to spend a little time realizing how they're moving in our life. And we can start to name them and start to build in virtues. So, let's look at the first one. Now, the, the first one is pride. Now, it, pride, is, pride is so big a category that really every other sin is lumped into it. I mean, but let's just read the definition. Pride is the sinful drive. Notice I'm calling it a drive, all right? It's a tendency. It, it, it has a lot of inertia going for it. It's moving heavily. and you got to push hard against it to get it to stop, all right? So pride is there. Pride is the sinful drive that distorts proper self-love. There is something called well-ordered self-love that we should have for ourselves. We should know our gifts, and we should know how to care for ourselves and love ourselves in a proper way. But this drive distorts proper self-love so that we esteem ourselves more than is proper, and at the same time, we denigrate the goodness of others. There is such a thing as well-ordered self-love. I just made that point in self-esteem. But pride is just the pure love of self, which is perverted and causes us unjustly to think of others as beneath us or less worthy. Pride also stirs us to reject lawful authority uh, of others over us, including God, and refuses appropriate submission. Pride is at the root of really every sin. Why? Because through it we pridefully think we have a better way than what God has set forth, or that we alone can be the judge of right and wrong. Adam and Eve wanted to, quote, be like gods. This is what Satan plugged into. All right? He, he's holding something back. You really can't trust him, and he's, you should be the gods. You should, I will decide what I want to do, and I will decide whether it's right and wrong. No one is going to tell me what to do. God, in effect, is now becomes the boogeyman. He's, he's, he's a, a competitor for my power and my prestige. He must go. I must be glorified. See, and that's what Adam and Eve were tempted. See, again, you will be like gods, and you'll start telling him what to do. All right? That's the kind of the essence of the temptation. Um, they wanted to, quote, be like gods, and they wanted themselves to determine right from wrong. Hence, they demanded to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This is pride. Now, it's also a sin against trust. You notice again that title of the tree is important, isn't it? Most people just pass right over that. Some of you have been with me in talks before, and you know the word knowledge in the Bible is never simple intellectual knowing. Knowledge in the Bible is experience. Better, probably better translated experiential knowing. So, for example... Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bore a child, or a son. Now, obviously we're talking there about more than intellectual conversation between them, right? A deep, intimate, personal experience of Eve is what's meant by knowing, right? Now, therefore, to know means to have deep, intimate, personal experience of the thing or person known. Now, if that's the case, why then we turn back the knowledge of the tree the, the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the tree of the experience of good and evil. God was saying, look, Adam and Eve, I never want you to experience evil for yourself. I want you to trust me. I will tell you what is right and wrong, what is good for you, and what is bad for you. And if you will trust me, you will live free from the terrible slavery and tyranny of sin. But if you choose to eat from that tree, I tell you now, Death-directed drives will rise up in you that will one day end your life. You will die spiritually, and you will eventually die physically. And knowing that, Adam and Eve still sinned. Welcome to the better deal they wanted. Paradise lost. Now, 
the essence of that sin is pride. I will not be told what to do, what to think, what is right, what is wrong. I will decide. And you see what's happening today in our culture. You push God to the periphery, and suddenly we decide what's right and wrong. Now, at some level, you might say, oh, look, anything goes, man. But that's not true, is it? <laughs> there are certain sins du jour that become very popular. Right now, it's, you know, racism and all the other times, you know, it's bigotry, homophobia. But there are always going to be these pet sins that, by God, if you don't comply, you must be destroyed. So, again, there is still going to be right and wrong, but we decide. And we will decide certain sins go off the radar, like fornication or adultery or you know, killing people at the end of their life through euthanasia, or, or I could go on with the list, abortion, or, you know, again, um, on and on I go. Uh, lying, cheating, you know, greed. All these go off the radar, but certain things come on that radar, and by God, you'd better comply or else. Now, but again, at the end of the day, it doesn't always lead to a complete destruction of right and wrong, but it's sort of a selective, and we start to bludgeon each other, and we're seeing a lot of that in our culture today, right? Now, all of these are ways of saying that pride is, in effect, it's an inordinate love of myself and esteem of myself. It is a rejection of lawful authority over me, that I do not have all the gifts that I need to be taught, that I need to be instructed, that I need God, that I did not cause myself to exist. I should honor those who have taken care of me, like parents and other authority figures, and recognize that I don't have all the gifts, and you don't have all the gifts, but together we have all the gifts, all right? Now, pride, or the humility, which is the remedy for pride, is not like, oh, shucks, I'm nothing, you know. <laughs> Don't do that, see, because you do have gifts, and God gave them to you, and you better use them, because I need you to use them. And so does everyone else in this room. But you need to remember that they are gifts. You know, I, I'm able to talk, and I'm, I can yammer on forever, but I can, I'm a pretty good writer, I write on and write on. But you know, somebody taught me. I didn't just wake up one day, you know, come out of the womb writing. And even then, you know, mom, I depended on mom and dad for that, right? I mean, but, you know, someone had to teach me how to read and write. Someone had to develop. My father taught me a discipline of reading. He was a voracious reader, and he just taught me the discipline. Uh, he himself was a fairly good writer. He was articulate, and he certainly, well, uh, Aunt Allie and Uncle Dave will affirm dad certainly had strong opinions, and he could tell you all about them. <laughs> but, but again, the point is that there's a background to whatever gifts I have or whatever gifts you have. Somebody taught you. Somebody certainly, you know, by God's grace, conceived you and raised you and changed your diapers. You know, that was pretty disgusting, frankly. <laughs> you know? And someone took good care of you and raised you. And so all the gifts you have come to you from God more often than not through others. And so we have a lot of gratitude. But we do have gifts. But remember, they are gifts. And say, oh, Lord, I'm so grateful. Now help me to use these gifts so that others can benefit. All right, so humility isn't like, I have no gifts, I'm just, a, I'm just nothing, I'm dumb, I'm stupid. That's not, that's not true either. That's an excess of the virtue of humility. Whereas what we want to look for then is a proper humility. What is humility? Humility is reverence for the truth about myself. And the reverence for the truth about myself is that I'm gifted, but I don't have all the gifts. I'm, by God's grace, I, I'm his son, but I am, I am flawed, and I need mercy, and I need grace. I am incomplete. I need him, I need others, and so on. And I need to be part of a human community that recognizes both dependent, interdependency, but also recognizes a powerful sense that I have something that I, I need to, you know, to offer and something I need to receive, which is really what I mean by interdependency. All right, so you see the idea here. Um, and again, the other big source of pride in our culture is I will not be told what to do. I will not be taught. I will decide for myself. Thanks be to God, all of you are humble today. You come to be taught. You know? But there's a lot of people in our culture that say, don't, don't, don't tell me what to do. I know better. You know, huh? I don't need a church. Don't tell me. Uh -uh. I know. Don't. And there's a lot of pride in that. Now, even those, those of us in the church and all of us here tonight, we can cop an attitude pretty quick, too, when somebody suggests that we're wrong about something or we don't have all the facts. So, you see, we have to be careful. Pride is a very deep vein. And you see, the other thing is that it taps right into fear. Because somebody suggests, you know, you don't have all the facts right. Oop, we get fearful because we know we don't have all the facts right. And we get angry. And so you see, a lot of other sins start tumbling out of pride. In fact, pride is so central to, the, to all of our sins, it is the 
fundamental root of every sin in our life, all right? which is an ext- extreme or inordinate love of self. If you turn your thing over, look at that little tree there. Even before you have the seven deadly sins, what is the real root of all sin? An inordinate love or esteem of myself. All right? But beyond that, then you have concupiscence of the eyes, concupiscence of the flesh, and pride, right? So the seven deadly sins break into these three main branches off the tree, right? So we, if you go up through the center there, you've got pride, which then leads to vanity, acedia, namely sloth, or, and envy, and anger. Whereas concupiscence of the eyes leads to greed, concupiscence of the flesh leads to lust and gluttony. So there are these sort of three branches that then yield all seven of the of the sins. And it's kind of a quick to mystic synthesis, but it's rooted in this text from 1 John. Everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God will live forever. So you see, these teachings don't just come out of some monastic setting somewhere, you know, but rather they do come from the scriptures. You see, those three fundamental roots of sin are the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And all the sins are sort of subcategorized from there. Now, with that in mind, turn, turn back over. I will say this, that so serious is pride, so serious that Thomas in the Summa says that as a remedy for it, God actually permits other sins. That's pretty pretty serious stuff, y'all. You know, and and y'all been, some of you have been through chemotherapy. What is chemotherapy? They put poison in your system to kill off cells. And they're aiming for certain cells and not others. But basically what you're dealing with, when you take chemotherapy, you're taking poison, right? And that's how serious cancer is, that we take poison into our system to kill it. And we, we know there's a lot of side effects to it, right? Now, it's the same with pride. So serious is pride that God allows other sins to be the remedy. Now, usually, Thomas says, the, the, the sins that are most commonly a remedy for pride are, are, are gluttony, uh, lust, um, you know, are, are glut, are gluttony and lust. And um, we see that um, those are the sins that most humiliate us, frankly. You know, being drunk and <laughs> found in your own vomit is pretty embarrassing. <laughs> being pulled over by the police, you know, is criminal. <laughs> uh, likewise, uh, when it comes to sex, people are very easily shamed. I don't care how sophisticated and, you know, it's okay, man, that our world is today. People are pretty quickly humiliated by sexual sins. There's a lot of humiliation. Thomas says there's a reason for that, that the sins of, uh, of gluttony and, and lust are those types of sins that most are akin to what we share with the animals. Uh, but also, you notice that in the Garden of Eden, the first thing Adam and Eve felt was they were naked, and they were ashamed and embarrassed, and they covered up. So there's a very deep root of shame and, and humiliation when it comes to sexual sin and also overeating and overdrinking, you know? Um, we, there's a lot of shame, shame associated with these things. So, with all that in mind, those aren't the only sins, but Thomas says that usually these are the sins that God permits. He does not cause, oh, God made me do it, to keep me humble. <laughs> I'm going to keep looking at pornography to stay humble. Oh. <laughs> do not absolutize the point. Do not do that, okay? But it's, it's, it's God permits, he does not cause, he does not approve of, but he permits that sometimes we experience our weaknesses so that pride will be ameliorated, it will be lessened. That's how serious pride is, see? And it's always going on in the background. It's really at the root of every other sin. Now, let's go through the others a little more quickly. Greed, the sinful drive that stirs up excessive desire for wealth and possessions. It is the insatiable desire for more. Would you please underline that word? We're going to get back to that. It is not wrong to desire what we actually need, but through greed we hoard things, we acquire far beyond what we need or what is reasonable, and we fail to be generous and bless the needy and the poor. Through greed we can also come to see the things of this world as more precious than the things of heaven. Huge problem, huge problem, right? I, thanks God, heaven sounds nice, but would you just give me the new job? Or would you just give me better health? Or would you just give me the bigger house, 3,500 or 5,000 square feet would be nice. <laughs> Heaven can wait. All I care is just give me something nice. Give me a trinket. I'll be satisfied with the trinket. See? Now, everything is a trinket compared to heaven, but you see, we, we lose that. Now, greed is the insatiable desire for more. That word insatiable is important. Okay? Greed is 
masquerading with a lie. Just one more piece of meat, you'll be happy. One more beach house. One more boat. One more girlfriend. Whatever. One more, and you'll be happy. Anyone there yet? <laughs> the world cannot cut the deal. You, your deepest experience is you have an insatiable longing. And only God can fill that pot spot. Every other thing that comes to you and says, I can fill that spot, is lying. It cannot do it. It cannot cut the deal. It is finite. Your desire is infinite, infinite. You have an infinite longing. Your heart was made for God. Only God can satisfy you. But greed says, no, no, one more thing and you'll be happy. So it, first of all, is a lie. Secondly, as I say, it's an insatiable desire. Okay? Because, again, um, it's never going to be enough. You know, when does a person, let's just take a person who's earning, I don't know, 400000 a year. You know, I basically just need about 100000 I can do pretty well. I think I'll just take the other 300000 and, you know, give it away or invest it so other people can work or I'll, I'll found a business or I'll, I'll do something to bless other people. When do we ever get to that point? No, 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 no. Now I need the Bethany Beach House. Now I need to enlarge the Bethany Beach House. I need to get the boat polished. I need matching SUVs. I mean, I, I just, I've had it up to here with having to walk out of the bathroom to catch the news. I'm putting a TV in the bathroom. <laughs> Whatever. It's never enough. Never. Never, never, never. We live like kings and queens. I mean, a hundred years ago, who had running water? Very few people. Who had a nice indoor, you know, maybe 120 years ago, who had an indoor toilet? Who had electricity or air conditioning? Come on, y'all. We got it made. We live like king. We live better than kings and queens did 150 years ago. The best they could have are these people with these fans, you know. <laughs> Come on. I mean, it's incredible, and it's never enough. We're like, oh, you know, my iPhone isn't working. <laughs> you know. I mean, we're we're just. And, and you see the idea, what that does to us, right? We're always crestfallen, always like, I don't have enough. Where can I get? He's got that. How come I get it? God, where are you? I said, look what I've given you. Electricity, air conditioning, lights, brothers and sisters. You get in cars. You drive on roads you didn't pave. You go all over the place. And you say, what? I don't have enough? Oh, you are so sick with greed. Never enough. Never enough. That's greed. And it's a very deep, gnawing drive. In all of us. Now, I think it's partly rooted in the survival complex. You know, we tend to hoard because it might, we might have a drought tomorrow. But, you know, in our culture, the drought almost never comes. And even if it does come, frankly, your iPhone isn't going to help you. Right? <laughs> frankly, all your money in the bank isn't going to help you if, if the whole thing collapses, you know. So my point to you is that, again, when do you ever say, I've got enough and I'm going to give the rest away? When do you ever say that? When do I? See, greed is one of the most under-confessed sins. As a confessor, I'll just say it in a very general sense. Very few people ever confess it. Because we're in a culture that says you don't have enough. Every advertisement is, you know, you're pathetic, you're poor, you're just, you're just not, you haven't made it until you buy our product, 1995, plus shipping and handling, and you'll be fine. <laughs> See? And you're not fine, but you still buy the lie, because you want it! See? And I say you, but we want it. Right? At some point, you have to lay hold of yourself and say, self... I've got enough. God's been good to me, and I'm going to give the rest away, or I'm going to at least set it aside to some good purpose. I don't need all this other stuff. But again, when do we ever get to that point? In our culture, almost never. It's always that other guy who earns a dollar more an hour than I do. He's greedy. See, we equate greed with wealth. Well, if that's the case, we're all wealthy. Who do you know anywhere else in the world that lives like we do in America? Think of people just offshore in Haiti, the Dominican Republic, up in those hills. Think of places like that. And we live very well. We're in the top like 1%, y'all. We're rich, all of us. Even the poor people in this country are rich compared to people in other countries. Are you praying with me? Yes. Pride, greed, lust. Okay, the sinful drive that leads to an excessive or inappropriate desire, desires or thoughts of a sexual nature. It's not wrong to experience sexual desire per se, but lust perverts this. To either become excessive, that's all that matters, and so people just torpedo their whole life because of this, right? 
Okay? Or it becomes the, ob the object if it is inappropriate, for example, sexually fantasizing about someone other than a spouse. Or more broadly, lust is thought of as an excessive love for others that makes God and the love of God secondary. Okay? So people will obey their boyfriend instead of God. You know? They'll sleep with their boyfriend because he asks, even though God says no. Or again, work, working back up through the list, you know, again, we, we sometimes again have just an inappropriate object to our sexual desire, someone that we're not married to, and so on. What's the difference really between lust and love? Well, lust, well, love regards the person, lust only the body. Baby, you got the curves, I got the angles. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's lust. There's a person attached to those curves, my friend. You know, she's a person. See, and, but lust just says, no, she's a, an object for pleasure. Whether visually, I'm going to visually enjoy her or f ultimately physically enjoy her, but she's, a, she's not a person. She's an object. And when she no longer pleases me, I can walk away from her. No, she's a person. See, so you see the difference between, at the heart of the, the distinction between lust and love is, is that lust treats a person like an object for sexual pleasure, whereas love regards the person. Okay, now, another aspect about uh, lust that we should consider is that Jesus says, whoever looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his thoughts. And of course, this, this leads a lot of people to question, well, what is the Lord getting at there? Well, first of all, let's talk about what he's probably not getting at, which is that to simply find people attractive of the opposite sex, is not, that's not to look at them with lust, all right? Um, but secondly, um, and we all, I think, sometimes have thoughts that are sinful, that pop up in our mind, sort of involuntarily. And we dismiss them. And that's not lust either. But here's where lust, I think, kicks in. And it's a good definition for lust. It's basically what we call today sexual fantasizing, right? Where we go with the thought and we advance it and we stay with it and we consider that person and we, you know, I don't need to give you any more details. But the idea is that we sexually fantasize. Obviously, Jesus is excluding all pornography. If, if you're struggling with pornography, again, a lot of people do, but at least call it what it is. It's a sin. It is, it is not a victimless crime. You think of that little that, that woman you're looking at. She, when she was 10 years old, was she dreaming of that? Dreaming of doing that? See? Something's gone terribly wrong in your, her life. You are dealing, you're looking at a tragedy. You're looking at someone's life who's gone just disastrously wrong. Maybe she's desperate. Maybe she's addicted to drugs and needs the money. Maybe she's just lost and lonely. But you're looking at a tragedy. That's what you're looking at, see? Okay, so, but again, the idea is all pornography is excluded, obviously. And then, of course, you know, sitting there mentally undressing people in a meeting or things, you, you get the idea, all right? Um, that's where I think the Lord is talking. So it's when we are, our will becomes engaged and we move forward with the thought. And obviously then, you know, some people say, what's wrong with masturbation? Well, it's a sin. Is it always a mortal sin? Not always, because sometimes it's done through weakness. But at the end of the day, it's a sin because it involves sexual fantasizing. You got a problem with that? You better talk to Jesus because he said it. I didn't. He go, oh, Jesus was not uptight about that stuff. I'm like, well, wait a minute. Uh, I was just quoting him. Now, uptight is you know their word. Again, the Lord loves you know if you're struggling with masturbation or something like that. Look, the Lord loves us, and some some people have habitual problems and they struggle with it. But again, at least call it a sin and. Bring it, bring it regularly to your confessor and talk to your confessor about it. But don't, don't go on making light of this stuff, you see. And that's what we do in our culture today. We just make light of it. I've got to keep moving. This list is, you know, I'm not getting through this fast enough. Pride, greed, lust, anger, oh my. The sinful drive that leads to an inordinate and unrestrained feelings of hatred and wrath. It is not always wrong to experience anger. I don't know if you've read in the Bible, but Jesus was angry like a lot. He wasn't just angry like once or twice. He was angry a lot. How much longer must I tolerate you? He said to the disciples one day, bring the child to me. And he cast out the demon. Or one day, uh, he was talking to the scribes and the Pharisees. He said, I, I have much to say about you, much to condemn you for. But I say only that which my father has given me to say. But I tell you this, if you do not come to believe who I, that I am, you will die in your sins. And it goes on to say, he said this when he was in the offering room where they make the offerings. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, Jesus had a lot of, uh, he had a lot of anger in him. Now, uh, the righteous anger of a prophet. See, so not all anger is wrong, but what is wrong is this wrathful hatred or anger, basically what we're talking about, I will get you. I may not get you today, but I will destroy you somehow. I hate you. I wish this planet was without you. You're using up oxygen. I wish you were gone. Again, there is anger. We all experience hurts and angers, you see, but the Lord says, look, if you let that stuff grow in you, 
That's where murder comes from. That's where other terrible crimes, terrible things that come out of your mouth that you say to people that you can never take back. Be very careful. You know, our anger is a very unruly passion. It's not always sinful, but it's very unruly. And we, self-mastery with regards to anger is, um, is, is hard to come by. It's hard. When we get angry, we feel so right. We know the truth. You know, we just and don't press send. Wait till tomorrow before you write that email. Don't 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 press send. Wait a day, would you please? You'd be surprised how often you won't press send the next day. Anger has its time, but you see, mastery. Now, again, the sin of anger is that drive within us that is rooted usually in fears about my egocentric stuff and all that. And I, I, I bec- because of that, uh, I, I become very uh, anxious when anybody upsets my little world. You know, when you're building a house of cards, even a little breeze upsets you. You see the idea? And very often, again, our anger comes from a lot of these, you know, ideas that I'm so great and I should be respected and a lot of egocentric stuff that has no place in us. So, again, it's, an, it's a sinful drive. Now, gluttony, I don't want to talk about it. Let's move on. <laughs> It causes us to overindulge and or consume anything to the point of waste. We do not usually think of food and we usually think of food and drink, but gluttony can extend to other matters as well. Thus, this sin usually leads to a kind of a laziness and self gratification that has very little room for God uh, and the spiritual life. Overindulging in the world leaves little room for God. So for example, you know, a person has a big meal, what's your, what's your instinct? You want to sleep. Yeah. You know, and after a while, you know, you start to get overweight, your joints ache, you get sluggish, and your heart, you know. So it, it builds into our life a kind of a sluggishness. And likewise, drinking, we don't need to talk much about what that can do, right? I mean, it can very um, strongly affect our attitude, how we see things, and um, cause us to do a lot of sinful things. So, again, these are the gluttony would be regarding food and drink, okay? Let's continue to move on, because I do have to get through this list and add a couple things to it, and then I'm sure there'll be some questions. The other two, the last two, I think, are the most misunderstood of the, um, of the seven deadly sins. Um, the envy is not the same as jealousy. I think some of you have heard me on this before, but envy is not the same as jealousy. Jealousy, when I'm jealous of you, you have something that I want, and I might want it inordinately, and I might try to steal it or somehow appropriate it for me. But at least there's something good you have that I want, all right? And if it's sinful jealousy, then it's, it's you know, it's, a, it's an excessive desire for what you want, for what you have that I want. But when I'm envious of you, there's something good in you or something excellent in you that I want to destroy because I take it to lessen my own excellence in the sight of other people. You make me look bad. You're too holy. You're getting straight A's. You're, 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 you're getting the fame or the glory. People acknowledge you. They don't acknowledge me. You know, you see the idea. And that's what happens. And we become, quote, green with envy. Green with envy. Now, St. Augustine calls envy the diabolical sin because it's not just that you have a good that I want to possess. You have a good that I want to destroy. And that's diabolical. Goodness, excellence, is to be appreciated and loved. And there are, St. Thomas says two virtues should govern and overcome, help us to overcome envy. One is zeal and the other is joy. If I see excellence in you, I should be joyful that you have that gift. Because you don't have it alone, you have it for the community. And I can share in your gift. Likewise, uh, zeal, if I can possibly imitate your virtue. Not, not every virtue can be imitated. For example, not everybody in here is going to be a concert pianist just because they admire a concert pianist. You know, some, some of them just don't have the gift for that. But you can at least have joy for that gift. But there are other, uh, other virtues, for example, holiness, prayerfulness, um, generosity, that we should all have a zeal to imitate because it's possible for all of us. So again, the two responses to seeing goodness or excellence in another person should be zeal, try to imitate that goodness, and, and joy that someone has this gift. But what envy does is, you make me look bad. It goes all the way back to the playground, right? Some stupid kid in the front row, always getting straight A's, teacher's pet. The rest of us getting C's and D's. So you take them out in the playground, and you rough them up. And you say, you know, you're making me look bad. Huh? Stop getting straight A's. That's envy. Destroy the good. Rough them up. Stop behaving so well. Hang out with us and... Do dopey things and throw, throw a spitwad at the teacher occasionally. 
That's, that's envy, okay? Um, I will say that some, sometimes envy likes to parade in sheep's clothing, but it's still a wolf. You go to the playground, not the playground, you go to the soccer field. My little Johnny will be upset if the other team wins, so we're not going to keep score. My, my, brother, my, my, my brother has a son, my nephew, Charlie, super soccer player, so good that he would score just, man, he was just dribbling that ball right past all those kids. He, he's, in one game, he scored 17 points in soccer. That's, that's hard to do in soccer. And they call him off the field, you're making everyone look bad. You know, come on, let him start teaching these other kids. You know what I'm saying? The idea is that we, we, just, we, we, we are angry about excellence in our culture. Or if you give a dean's list, you know, at the school, oh, we, have, we can't, if we just award some kids, the other kids will be upset. <laughs> so, maybe they should be upset. He made the dean's list, why didn't you? I think both of you got brains. What's the deal? I mean, now again, maybe we shouldn't just have academic awards, but you get the idea. There's different gifts, but the point is that, you know, we start coming up with these dumb things. Everybody leaves with a trophy. Which means nobody leaves with a trophy. See? So be careful. That's, that's envy in sheep's clothing, but it's still envy because it, what it seeks to do is to denigrate good and elevate mediocrity. And mediocrity isn't terrible. It's, be, it's better than nothing ocrity. <laughs> but, but we should honor excellence and call it out. All right? Not in an overly exclusive way where all you care about is sports or all you care about is academics. Because there are different gifts. But the point is, real honor for excellence is important in a culture. And you know cultures heading south, like ours is, when it starts to say, um, we don't want to award excellence because people might feel bad. <sighs> Envy is ugly. It's diabolical. See, it's, it's a way of destroying goodness. See, all right. Sloth is not simple laziness. Sloth is sorrow or sadness at the good things that God is offering me. So I would add aversion. Oh, I know God's got a lot of stuff for me, but, you know, I'd have to, like, pray a lot. Oh, might have to give up some of my favorite sins. Um, might have to stop watching TV so much and maybe give away more of my money. Oh, that's just too much trouble. What's on TV tonight? Okay. Now, but I don't want you to think of it just as laziness, because, for example, a person might exhibit sloth in the following way. They sort of know that they should, you know, spend more time in spiritual things, but they, they run from it by becoming a workaholic. I've got a business to run. People are depending on me. I don't have time to go to church. I don't have time to pray. You know, let somebody else do that. I've got to be at work. I've got to do this. And you know, at work, they call me sir, and people depend on me. And everyone says, you're great. And so they spend all this time. They're working, working, working. But they're avoiding God. They're avoiding prayer. They're avoiding the sacraments. They're avoiding the Word of God. See? They're, they're, they're pulling on trinkets from the world, and they're, they're sorrowful or sad at the good things that God wants to offer. See? And that's a very deep drive. See? What is, there's something wrong with us, y'all. I mean, we're just, this, you hear the screw rolling around your head? There's a screw loose up there, right? <laughs> we desire things that we know are harmful, and we desire them in abundance. We don't desire things that we know are good for us. That's sloth. It goes back to when you were a kid and you wanted Twinkies, but your mother said, eat your vegetables, right? You knew, really, that vegetables were better for you, but you wanted Twinkies. See? And that just ramps up into the spiritual life as we get older. So the point is, isn't that, that's a very deep drive in us, that we don't desire what is good, and we do desire what is sinful. We call that concupiscence, right? Okay. Now, I've got to try to wrap up a, a couple more drives here, but I, and then bring it, bring, kind of put a bow on it. So just a couple of other thoughts that aren't on the list, but I think should be. If I, I would come up with maybe the dozen deadly sins, but the deadly dozen. But um, I want to add to this fear. My brothers and sisters, I've got to go through it quickly, but here we go. One of the deepest habit patterns of sin, and you know, people don't even recognize it as a sin right away, is fear. It is awesome how afraid we are. We're afraid of everybody. We are more afraid of man than we are of God. We're afraid of physical dangers, sure, but that's not really the big point here. Mostly we're afraid of being rejected by other people and of not being liked by other people and not fitting in. And we will do almost anything to go along with the flow and be liked and be thought of as approved in the sight of men. We will commit even very serious sins to do it. Right? It goes all the way back to when we were kids. You know, A kid will just join a gang, 
hang out with his friends, you know, let's go do some vandalism, man, if you're cool, you'll join us. Or a girl will sleep with her boyfriend because she's desperate to be loved, you know. Even knowing that that's, it's a sinful thing and God says no, she's so desperate to be loved and thought of and approved. And, or again, you know, maybe those are heavy sins, but how about a, a lighter example? You know, you just walk up to a group and they're gossiping. And instead of saying, hmm, this is not right, this is sinful, and try to change the conversation, you just join right in. Now, I don't, but you do. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I agree with you, and I think we need to talk about so-and-so even more. You know, we just join right in. Because we just, we, we say, what's the group talking about? i got to fit in, got to fit in. And we just, whatever they're doing, we just, just jump right in, right? A lot of this political correctness that we have today, or I would call it politically approved speech, a la 1984, and, you know, some of the, if you haven't read that book, go sell everything you have and buy a copy. But... <laughs> But um, it is incredible. We, do, we will do almost anything. We will sin very seriously. We are more afraid of man than we are of God. And that's fear. We are so afraid and we're so dominated by this fear that we'll sin rather than obey God. And that has to got to go. It's got to go. The Lord says, look, I've got, sim- got a way to simplify your life. You fear me and you're not to fear anybody else. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You have a holy reverence for God. Your goal in life is to please God. And you let God go to work and deepen that in your life. And if you can kneel before God, you can stand before any man. But it's going to take time because we are very anxious and afraid of what other people think of us. And thousands of sin come from that drive. I'm so surprised it's not on the list. So surprised. Maybe maybe they're folding it up into pride. But I'm just going to tell you right now, fear, huge. It's driving 80% of your sins, driving 80% of them. And it also drives anger. Okay. Now, another one I, I don't have time to develop as much as I'd like, but again, um, is, is ingratitude. Brothers and sisters, it is awesome how ungrateful we are. Every day, 10 trillion things go right. And about a half a dozen things might go wrong. I tell you, I'm not exaggerating when I say 10 trillion. You think of every cell of your body, every fiber of every cell of your body, every part of every cell of every atom of every, every part of every atom of you, and God is holding it all together. That's just inside your body. All the systems of your body working together, see? Outside photosynthesis is going on. We have CO2, and uh, we put it out, and the trees take it and give us back oxygen. That's going on all day long for us. You've got the Van Allen belts up there. They're moving off the harmful rays of the sun so we don't get cooked down here. You've got Jupiter and Saturn out there catching comets. <laughs> Do I need to go on? Every day, 10 trillion things go right. And a few things go wrong. <laughs> you know, we must give God a migraine headache. <laughs> it is incredible how ungrateful we are. In a minute, in a minute, we're ungrateful. Brothers and sisters, I will tell you this much too. I believe that the source of most mental illness is ingratitude. If we would just change our perspective and realize how blessed we are from moment to moment, grateful people are different. They're more joyful, they're more confident, they're more serene, they're more generous. Jesus says to you in every Mass, remember. He says, do this in remembrance of me. Do this in memory of me. Anamnesis in the Greek. What does that mean? It means have so present to your heart and your mind what I have done for you so that you are grateful and different. Grateful people are different people. How much of our grumbling and complaining and you know, bitterness and being mad that this didn't happen or that would just go away if we just counted our blessings. Oh, Lord, you've been so good to me, see? But if we're forgetful of that, and we are in a minute when something goes wrong, we just we all get all fixated, we're negative, we're grumbling, we complain, we're cynical, we're bitter, we're, you know, constantly, you know, we just, what do you call that when you just keep thinking of something over and over? Resentful, resentful resentful. All that negativity would just go away if we could cultivate gratitude. We are so ungrateful and so many sins come from it. Okay? Now, I don't have time to develop much more, but take that other little hand out and then we'll wrap up and we'll take a break for questions, all right? Remember, I asked you to ponder with me some of these deeper drives that are so deep, they're going on all the time, you hard to even notice them. Like, when was the last time you thought about, man, I got a lot of fear going on that I need to repent of? 
I got a lot of ingratitude going on that I need to. Or when was the last time you know you necessarily thought about sloth or envy and so on? They're almost so there all the time that unless you really stop and think. So again, the Lord says, why don't you spend a little time when you get ready for confession, asking the question why, and start with a list like this, uh, the, the 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 seven deadlies and a couple things I added. So you have it folded and you open it up now. Notice again, this is the way the list works. You start out with some external behaviors or observable behaviors, and then you're gonna, we're going to start to go deeper with each group. Now, I won't read the whole list out to you, but again, we all do commit sins against justice, modesty, purity, truth, sins against the human person, the children and the young, the innocent and the trusting, the frail and the elderly. We commit sins against the unborn and infants, sins against the weak and the powerless, immigrants and strangers, the poor and the disadvantaged against the sanctity of marriage, sanctity of the family, the priesthood, and consecrated life. We commit a lot of sins. Okay, not just by commission, but also by omission. But now we, start, we still have some kind of external things here. Here are some sins of omission. We, we fail to give witness to Christ. We fail to submit our will to God or give a good examples. Seek God, act justly, show mercy, repent of our sins, and so on. Just scan down that list there to the break. All these things we fail to to do so easily. But here comes where this list starts to go a little deeper now. Now we're starting to look at some attitudes, all right? Sins committed out of fear or indifference or contempt. Sins committed out of impurity, hatred, laziness, cowardice, anger, greed, jealousy, revenge, disobedience, hard-heartedness, pride, envy, stinginess, selfishness, pettiness, spite, self-indulgence, lust, careless neglect, and prejudice. Those are drives. Those are attitudes. And they spawn these sins that we see on the outside. Or again, let's continue. Look at some of these. <laughs> now, none of this is true of me, but I, I just thought I'd mention it to you. Um, I, I can be obnoxious, dishonest, egotistical, undisciplined, weak, impure, arrogant, self-centered, pompous, insincere, unchaste, grasping, judgmental, impatient, shallow, inconsistent, unfaithful, immoral, ungrateful, disobedient, selfish, lukewarm, slothful, unloving, uncommitted, sinful, and just plain mean. <laughs> But Lord, somehow in all this, you still love me. Thank you, Lord. Now just flip the page. This is from an old song. I've been unfaithful, I've been unworthy, unrighteous, unmerciful, unreachable, unteachable, unwilling, and undesirable. I have been unwise, I've been unsure, but because of all that you went through, I know that I've never been unloved. I've been unbroken, unmended, uneasy, unapproachable, unemotional, unexceptional, undecided. I've been unqualified, I've been unfair, I've been unfit. But you've been so good to me, Lord. See, now, I'm trying to show you just by this little example. You start out with some of the external behaviors at the front of the list, but you begin to go deeper to attitudes, see, and drives. Spend some time with a list like this. I've got longer lists than this. Um, but I just brought a shorter one. But next time you go to confession, this is a different way to prepare, isn't it? You're not just looking at commandments and trying to find external you know, ways you've not fit them, you know, but you're looking now, see, at this, you're looking at some of the deeper drives and attitudes, you know? You, not everything on this list is true about you, but some of it is. What's that all about? See, what's it? Teach me, Lord. How can I overcome some of this, right? A couple of the quick sources I mentioned to you, again, is Peter Kreef's book, okay? I only had about an hour tonight. This is something that really requires, you know, a multiple, you know, just long time of study, but Learn these drives. Start to name them. See? And if certain things occur to you on this list, circle it or just jot it down mentally if you don't want someone to see what you circled. <laughs> but, but um, you know, unapproachable. Anyone hear that way? Unapproachable. Huh? You know, that's on that list, right? Hey, what's that all about? Are you afraid? What's, that, what's going on there? See? Let the Lord teach you. You know, anyone been, let's see, pompous? Not me. Never me. But maybe that person you know and love has been pompous, right? Okay, just kidding. All right. Listen, bless you for your patience. We're going to take a break. I'll let you introduce our break. But, um, but we'll take some questions. And I know there's a lot. But um, I had to go through a lot of material quickly. But I hope you found it valuable. But remember, the, the church gives us some of these deeper drives. This is not just... So if you want confession to come alive and really be part of your spiritual life, spend time asking that revolutionary question. Not just what am I doing, but... Why? And this, these lists are meant to help you maybe discover some of the answers to that why. All right? Good. Thank you so much, Monsignor. Thank you.
you know, it's kind of thank you and not thank you at the same time. A lot of things are exposed there, you know. Um, you know I was thinking of, uh, you know, David with the line from Hidden Faults Acquit Me, oh, you yeah. know. It's, uh, we need that examination of conscience and constant reflecting uh, to sort of, it's very easy to become <laughs> numb to the varying ways in which we can fall. And I was thinking um, from the, uh, this is one of the um, prayers of the intercession for uh, the Liturgy of the Hours. And as we bless you, Almighty God, King of the universe, because you called us while we were yet sinners. Right? Praise God. I think of uh, this little boy that I'll always remember, sixth grade student, who for whatever reason um, hadn't received the sacrament of um, penance until sixth grade. And um, the day that he received it, oh boy, <laughs> was his face just lit up, just as proud as can be, and had this, you know, he got a little uh, crucifix from his parents, and he received that sacrament in the middle of the school day. And the rest of the school day, just walking around, just beaming, you know, because he knew that his father loved him. Uh, so thank you so much, one senior. So, yeah, questions? So, Father, I, I'm looking at this list, and, and I'm having a hard time finding ones that I wouldn't circle, right? And, and so, so I guess the, the question I have is, where's the line between, you know, scrupulosity and despair yeah, right. and being realistic about how to approach this? I think there's, there's two different ways to talk about scrupulosity. There's clinical scrupulosity, which uh, some have, and then we kind of use the term more generally. Clinical scrupulosity is a very serious form, of, frankly, of mental illness, rooted in kind of an obsessive-compulsive disorder. But it, it's an excessive desire for certainty that I'm not in bad favor with God. So the, the heart of the problem for a truly scrupulous, in the clinical sense, person is that they require absolute certainty of their status before God, which isn't given. So it takes a very strong spiritual director to really lead them, somebody along with mental health counseling. So, but I don't think you're talking about that type of scrupulosity. The other form of scrupulosity is just, it's sort of a subset of pride, frankly. So I got news for you. Even scrupulosity is a sin. For it in pride. The idea is that we become so excessively focused on sin, mostly for our own sake and for, our, for wanting to feel safe ourselves, whereas true sorrow for sin, which is the gift to ask for, is I love God and I don't want to offend him, but I know he loves me and he wants to help me do better. So it, lo- it makes you run to God. So St. Paul describes two types of sorrow in, I think it's 2 Corinthians 7 or 8, He talks about godly sorrow and worldly sorrow. And he says in that passage, worldly sorrow produces death. Not literal physical death, but I mean it it just drags you down. Makes you feel lousy, stinking, rotten. You know, that's worldly sorrow. Whereas godly sorrow produces repentance. It makes you run to God and say, I'm so glad you love me. And I'm so glad you died for me. You sent your son to die for me. And I I love you and I love him and I want to do better. So... I think that if, if I could just recommend that you pray for what we would call either the gift of tears or maybe godly sorrow, which is not self-denigrating, but makes you run to God. Okay? And not, not you, you say, but all of us struggle with that to some degree. You stole my thunder just a little bit at the end of your question, but I was contemplating the attitude that we enter confession with. The difference between admitting our sin and coming with repentance mm-hmm. for our yeah, sin. Right. So admitting our sins is, again, we just accept the fact that we've done them. Metanoia, the Greek word that tends to be undergirding the word we translate repentance. Unfortunately, in English, we hear the word repentance more like clean up your act. But metanoia, or the, the imperative, or Jesus says metanoia te, you know, literally means to come to a whole change of mind. Meta meaning change or some sort of transformation, and noia, or noyate, meaning the way we think. Change the way you think. So, in other words, here's how a typical person will talk who doesn't really know God. Uh, it's not so bad. How come I can't have it? It's, everyone else is doing it. You know, Is that the way the saints talk? No. The saints talk like this. If God wants it, I want it. If God doesn't want it, I don't want it. Now, to come to a change of mind is that journey that we call repentance. So, Repentance is, again, more than just making a firm purpose of amendment, which is good, 
but it also means to, to come to a change of thought or attitude, which is kind of what we were talking about tonight, the seven thoughts, or and I would add again a few more to them, uh, the deadly dozen if I were to add the full list out. But, but again, there's a, a sense of um, coming to a change in the way we think and looking to some of our attitudes, which are forms, or they're, they're both kind of related to our emotions as well as our thoughts, our third of our emotions influenced by our thoughts. You know, we have attitudes. And so I think that m- repentance involves really looking at those and saying, are all those attitudes of God? And they're not. And what, what needs to go? And again, running to him like a daughter or like a son and saying, you know, you're my father and I love you and I know you love me and help me, help me. Monsignor, under the section on lust, you talk about, there's an example here on sexually fantasizing about someone other than a spouse. Recently heard a priest say that even your spouse could be the object of lust if you are yeah. treating them yeah. as an object. Yeah. Can you comment on that, please? Yeah, I think, you know, the first one to really sort of bring that out uh, to our, our type of thinking in the church was Pope John Paul. I think all of us could have figured out before, you, you could certainly sin sexually against your spouse by the way you think of them. You know, a husband might think of his wife in ways she'd be horrified <laughs> to, think, to think that he's thinking about her. So again, they're, they're one, one could certainly, I think, transgress. It's, it's not something that we've developed a great deal in the literature, but it is certainly, I would affirm, as true. I think all of you who are married, again, you, you know that what your spouse is like and what they're not like, and it's never a good idea to fantasize that your spouse is someone other than who they really are. The problem with all fantasy is that it's not rooted in reality. It's not healthy. And, you know, an occasional dream of how things could be. But at the end of the day, um, you need to try to love the spouse you actually have, not a fanciful version of that spouse. And I don't want to get into details. It's not an appropriate thing to talk about in this kind of a venue. But one could maybe imagine doing things with their spouse that their spouse definitely would not find wonderful. And that would be, I think, a form of sinning against them sexually. Yeah. Thank you, Monsignor. Um, it seems like it would be obvious, but mm-hmm. I'm not sure you spoke of worldliness. Mm-hmm. Could you touch on worldliness for oh, that's us? Right. It was on the list. I forgot. Yeah. I just ran out of time. Worldliness, I think, would be, um, well, maybe it is obvious, but what I mean by it is maybe a little less obvious. I think we're all a little bit worldly in the sense we like trinkets and toys and, you know, all that stuff. But what I mean by worldliness is this attitude. People have everything 180 degrees backwards. What do I mean by that? They have taken and put the church and scripture on trial because it doesn't make sense based on our worldly thinking. Well, that's the, uh, uh, well come the church teaches that. Well, why is the Bible teaching that? That's so backwards. You know, Paul says women should be submitted to their husbands. What's wrong with the Bible? What's Paul was a misogynist? You know, and people talk like that. Even pew sitters talk like that. Now that's 180 degrees backwards because it's supposed to be the world that's on trial based on the word of God. But people have put the word of God on trial based on worldly thinking. And that's what I was really getting at there by worldliness. Not to dis, not include you know, the kinds of stuff that we sort of tuck under greed. But I'm distinguishing it from greed in this sense that there's this attitude that what the world thinks is right and the church is out of date and the Bible's out of date. And Paul was a homophobe and he hated women and whatever other issues are all ascribed to Paul by a world that's just gone mad with sin, and looks at Paul as a lunatic, or Jesus, or, you know, of course, they've reinvented Jesus, so they've taken care of him, you know, Jesus would never say that, well, I'm quoting him, uh, well, we, we know he did not say that, the church must have put those words in his mouth, <laughs> yeah. but, so Jesus gets a pass, but only because he's been reinvented and turned into a harmless hippie, but the point is that, that's what I mean by worldliness, and so I, I'm sorry, I, I meant to get to that, again, here's, here it is, one more time, We have put the Bible, God's Word, and the church's teachings on trial based on the fact that the world doesn't think that way, when what we should be doing is having the world on trial, saying, why does the world say A when when the God says not A? The world's supposed to be on trial. Jesus said regarding the Holy Spirit, when he comes, he will convict the world. He will convict this world. Let the Holy Spirit have that in your life, so... If you had to classify uh, pornography addiction into a drive, Mm -hmm. which drive would that be? You know, it's hard to say, isn't it? I mean, it's obviously an X to lust in the most obvious sense, isn't it, right? But it it could be a form of gluttony. It could also be a form of greed. I mean, there's a lot that could factor into it. Do you have a thought in mind that you want to... 
loneliness. Because by definition, you are too selfish to love or please anyone but yourself. You are just fully. I mean, you can't anyone else because you are just too selfish. Selfish, interesting. Selfish, lonely. Well, I will say this, that there is, there is a, a sense among men today, and I'm, I'm sorry, ladies, I don't, mean to, I don't mean this is true. I'm just going to say, a lot of guys say women are just too complicated. I'd rather fantasize and, you know, look on the porn and, you know, do what, do what men will sometimes do. I don't want anyone, you know, masturbate, basically. But the point is that it is, relationships are complicated. There is a person attached to that body. You know, I would say, I, mean, I kind of warn men, I, please don't mistake what I'm about to say. I don't mean this in a rude sense, but a guy says, ooh, man, that girl's like, wow. And I'm like, yeah, wait till she opens her mouth. <laughs> now, I don't mean that in the rude sense, but I mean, I mean it in the sense that, yeah, but, you know, you don't know anything about her. You just say, ooh, she's got curves. That's all, that's all you see. She's a person, and people are complicated. And she's got strength, she's got weaknesses, she's maybe had past traumas, and she has wonderful gifts, and, but just because she has the curves you like doesn't mean she's, you know, you know, and you don't have sex with a body, you have sex with a person. So all of this taps in, I think, to what you're saying, which is, it's a, it's a pretty sad and pathetic problem, because it, it does turn you in on yourself, and makes you live in a fantasy world. It's complicated and as hard as they are, relationships are what enrich us, not fantasy. It's just here and it's gone and it's never satisfied. And One of the things we've discovered, and I, I say we, not just the church, but also psychiatric doctors as well as uh, psychotherapists, is that this is one of the most powerfully addictive things that there is out there today. Because without, again, getting too descriptive, but a, a man looks at kind of ordinary, pardon the expression, but nudity, and, but that gets boring quickly. And, you know, the nature of an addiction is you need more and more of the thing to accomplish the purpose. You know, basically, you develop a resistance. For example, an alcoholic, at the beginning, you know, one glass of wine, that's enough. Makes you feel a little better, you feel better, and you're fine. But then the body adjusts, and now you need two glasses, and then a whole bottle, and then, you know, and you're off to the races. Uh, well, it's the same with pornography, but on steroids. I've had men sit in my office who are on their way to jail, you know, because they went to illegal youth sites and looked at minors and they were reaching out to people. Uh, they were breaking the law. And I said, how did you get into this mess? And little by little, Father, it just started out by looking at ordinary pictures and that wasn't enough and stranger and stranger things. And then you start getting these invitations. Hey, she just turned 18 yesterday. Come and look at her. She can't wait to show herself. And... And then suddenly 18 is going, that's not 18, well, she's legal. But all of a sudden 17, hmm, you know, and then 16, and all of a sudden the FBI is on, uh, knocking on the door, you know. Other people go in different directions where they get into the most base and ugly uh, fetishes and bizarre sexual things. The stranger, the better, you know, because what happens, they just dull their senses. And ordinary marital relations are like, oh, man, what a bore, you know, but, you know, all these crazy exotic things that frankly are not even possible physically for most people, you know. But the point is that that's where it goes. It's a very dark place. And uh, so, you know, by the way, people who struggle with this don't just deserve our score, and they do deserve our sympathy. They're, it's a very powerful drug, and it, it's, it's a hard thing to break. And I just thank God every day that that's not been one of my issues. I just thank God. But I know men who just struggle horribly, and some women too. It's a very addictive thing, and it takes a lot to break it. It really does, and it's hard. So walk with people. Uh, encourage them. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, would, I don't know how we can just say what's more addictive than something else, but it's, it's up in that category of heroin addiction. It's very hard to break. And it can be done, but it needs lots of encouragement and support and it can't be done alone but what happens I think with sometimes people find out someone's got a porn addiction like well that the heck with you but spelled differently and they just you know you know and I'm not saying you have to stay in relationships with people who are unrepentant and stuff but be careful not to too quickly rush to a, a complete destructive get out of my life kind of attitude um, it is a human problem and it's gone on steroids with this uh, internet stuff, which has a perception, only a perception, of uh, anonymity, and it's so easy. So a lot of men and women, too, struggle with it, all right? And we in the church are really working hard 
trying to help people. And there's a lot of these sites that are, we call them accountability software, where you have a buddy or someone that follows your, looks at your, the sites you visited. And that seems to be a pretty good way to break some of it and other good forms of psychotherapy. I know we're running late, so we'll leave it at that. But just say, this is not a course tonight on that topic, but it is, um, it's hard, it's powerful. And a lot of people, a lot, their name is Legion. They are many in our culture, okay? Thank you so much for your time. I'll okay. You. Thank Thank you. Thanks. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540 540- 635-7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist, pray for us.